A Fox News alert, more than 200 Americans now evacuated from the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in China. They're en route to the U.S. mainland right now, but the flight's destination had to be changed from Ontario, California, to a nearby military base. So far, no word on why the change. Welcome to a brand new hour of America's Newsroom. I'm Ed Henry. Developing situation. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sandra Smith. As the death toll from the outbreak continues to rise in China, health officials are taking no chances back here at home in evacuating those Americans from the city of Wuhan. All passengers had already been screened twice before they left China. They were monitored throughout the flight. And in an anchorage, the passengers were screened twice more and were approved to continue on to California by the CDC. In California, they will undergo additional screenings and finish the repatriation process. We have team coverage for you this morning. Feature a story News Bureau Chief Patrick Fox standing by in Beijing. But we begin with William Lajeunesse. He is live outside March Air Reserve Base in California as we await that plane's arrival this morning. Hey, William. Hey, Sandra. Indeed, the U.S. hopes to contain any outbreak here on the mainland and reduce concerns to the public by diverting that aircraft from the Ontario Commercial Airport east of L.A. to the March Reserve Base here in Riverside County. Now, Ontario is federally designated for this type of emergency. They had been outfitted a hangar with about 200 beds for this very purpose, but the CDC and State Department made the decision to land the jet here for, quote, logistical reasons. 201 passengers passengers aboard that chartered flight, mostly from the U.S. consulate in Wuhan. Some diplomats as well as business people working for U.S. companies there aboard that flight. They were screened twice in Wuhan for fever and symptoms. They were monitored by medical staff on board the flight. They were screened again during refueling in Anchorage. They were isolated there at an international terminal apart from the domestic passengers. They had no contact. Also, on board the flight, the pilot and flight crew had no contact with these passengers and they had a separate ventilation system, even though right now we don't know very much about how the coronavirus is actually transmitted. In Wuhan, China, of course, that's the epicenter of this epidemic. 132 fatalities so far, some 6,000 infected, and even 15 percent of those in, in isolated in the ICU have died. So uh, there's a major concern. The flight should be landing here at uh, March Reserve Base between 7.30 and 8 o'clock local. That's about between 30 minutes and another hour. We do not know if those passengers will be isolated here on the base or potentially taken by bus to a nearby motel. We don't know. I did spoke to a, a public information person for the uh, base. They did not know at this point in time that decision will be made by the CDC. We're expecting a news conference here at 11 o'clock local where we should learn more. We Back will be you, watching Sandra. and waiting on all of that. William Lajeunesse, thank you. Wow. The number of confirmed cases in China rising to nearly 6,000, making it more contagious than the SARS outbreak of 17 years ago. So far, though, it has been less deadly. Joining us now with an update, Feature Story News Bureau Chief Patrick Falk, live in Beijing. Patrick? Well, that's Sandra. There's a real state of fear here across the country, even in the capital, some 400 kilometers away from Grand Zero, uh, Wuhan. When you walk past people in the streets, nearly all of them are wearing uh, face masks and uh, many shops remain closed. If you do go into one that's open, they won't let you in unless you're covered up properly. So uh, the real worry in the capital city here, uh, when you go into malls and other public buildings, they are checking your temperature and registering your name and basically keeping tabs on everyone in case they come into contact with anyone that might be infected. Uh, now, elsewhere in villages and towns, we're hearing lots of reports of people barricading themselves and not letting outsiders come in and they're putting up signs saying uh, no gathering in crowds, something that the government has advised people not to do. And we've also heard some uh, worrying new reports just a short while ago that three foreign nationals have been infected, one Australian and two Pakistanis. They are the first such known cases. Uh, but the list of 
countries with infections and the number of overall infections as well as fatalities keep on going up. We just heard some of the figures just a moment ago. The government is ramping up its containment efforts. We've been hearing a lot about these hospitals that they're scrambling to build. One of them is meant to be uh, finished next Monday, the other one on Wednesday. We don't know exactly if they're on track right now, but people are watching that very closely indeed, and they're sending in a lot more medics to go and uh, look after people there. Uh, but those hospitals are only going to house a total of around 2,500 people, but the numbers have already surpassed that, and experts are expecting there to be a lot more infections still. All right. Patrick Fock, we appreciate that report on the ground. Thank you. This is a Fox News alert. Meanwhile, the next phase of impeachment begins this afternoon. Senators will now begin the portion of this process where they'll submit written questions to Chief Justice John Roberts, to lawyers for the White House and the uh, House managers. In the debate over uh, what happens with witnesses, that continues. President Trump's legal team wrapping up their opening arguments yesterday. You can't view this case in a vacuum. You are being asked to remove a duly elected president of the United States, and you're being asked to do it in an election year. So let's bring in the A-team. Brad Blakeman is the former deputy assistant George W. Bush. James Freeman, assistant editor of the Wall Street Journal editorial page and a Fox News contributor. And Gene Zeno, professor of political science at Iona College. Good morning Good to all morning, of you. Morning. Seemed to be last night, Brad, the momentum was moving towards there being witnesses in the Senate. Mitch McConnell telling his Republican colleagues, I don't have the votes to block witnesses, but you say it's moving in the other direction. I do. I think because the, the case uh, proves that. Um, the, the House did not call witnesses, and they voted on articles of impeachment. They claim they had overwhelming evidence that they presented in the Well, the, the House called trial. about 17 witnesses, but you're saying not... The, the witnesses that they, that they want in the, in the uh, removal. Um, so I think it's clear, uh, if you're a senator, the argument is, if you presented overwhelming evidence, and, and therefore those witnesses that you're now seeking to call are cumulative, they're not necessarily material, even though now they claim they're material, I think that's a great argument for senators to consider that the House moved too quickly, too hastily, without the kind of information that they now want or claim they need. And therefore, I think uh, Mitch McConnell is is uh, tamping down expectations, but I happen to believe that uh, that senators will come around, the votes will be there, I don't think... Well, we'll see what Sen Senator Congress. Lindsey Graham has to say, where he's expected to speak any moment now. Uh, we'll see what his message is, James. Chad Pergram, our, uh, on Capitol Hill for us, uh, just talked to Senator Susan Collins. She says that there is, she has no idea how the vote are going to fall when it comes to witnesses just moments ago she said that yeah and I think you saw after the uh, demand from the Democrats to hear from John Bolton uh, it was very clear immediately after that that they were not interested in a Bolton for Biden trade whether it's Hunter for Joe um, but I hope uh, as part of this process whether we get to hear witnesses or not uh, we'll get some of the documents that Lindsey Graham recently asked the State Department for hasn't gotten them it's about those uh, meetings and phone calls with Vice President Biden in 2016. There is kind of a media fairy tale that uh, when he demanded the firing of the prosecutor, it was after his son's company had been investigated. It actually, his series of phone calls happened after the oligarch running Burisma had his office raided by the Ukrainian prosecutor that, uh, that Biden uh, uh, got uh, fired. Mm. Gene, what, what say you? You know, I would have agreed with you, you know, before the Bolton revelations, but I think, it, you know, to Susan Collins' points, nobody knows how this vote is going to come out. We really could see witnesses, and I think either way, the Democrats feel like they are in a position to run this through to November. They are going to keep saying to the Republicans that 75% of the American public wants to hear witnesses. You have no idea what Bolton is going to say. How could you just shut this down without yeah. hearing? It's a sham trial. So they're going to use this either way which is why I think the Wall Street Journal was correct in calling for Bolton to come out and let us know what it is he has to testify to, which may, On I think, open some of question of what this. John Bolton will say. In the manuscript, at least the reports are that he's suggesting, claiming, which the president's denied, John Bolton, that the president told him he wanted the investigation of the Bidens to go forward and he was going to hold back the aid, suggesting at least a quid pro quo. Last night on Hannity, Senator Ted Cruz says none of that matters. Watch 
Quid pro quo doesn't matter. It's a red herring. It doesn't matter if there was a quid pro quo or not. The reason is a president is always justified and in fact has a responsibility to investigate credible evidence of corruption. Now, do I know for a fact that Joe Biden was corrupt? No, but there was more than enough for the president to say, hey, we ought to investigate it. It, I happen to believe with the senator. The senator happens to be a constitutional scholar. He knows what he's talking about. He clerked at the Supreme Court. But as a lawyer, the best evidence is the transcript itself, the four corners of the transcript. In addition to the transcript is what did the president do? The president did, didn't do anything that was alleged that he did. We know that from the transcript and we know that from his actions. Meaning the aid went Holding through. It, the aid went through and there was no quid pro quo. There was the meetings took place. So uh, there is no harm. There's no foul. Uh, there is no crime that's alleged in the uh, articles of impeachment. I'll read this tweet from the president just a few moments ago, James. Remember, Republicans, the Democrats already had 17 witnesses to your earlier point, we were given none. Witnesses are up to the House, not up to the Senate. Don't let the Dems play you. So interesting, as I tee up potentially hearing from Lindsey Graham a few moments from now, right. what he will be saying. Yeah, I think it all turns on this question of whether a reasonable person would look at the Biden situation and say, yes, that should be investigated. Obviously, there's no crime alleged, but in terms of the propriety of the, the president's action, and I, I think... Uh, uh, again, uh, this is another area where I think Lindsey Graham has been seeking documents. It's impossible to, well, I won't say impossible, it's highly unlikely that nobody at the White House Counsel's Office in the Obama era or the Vice President's own legal counsel office wouldn't have said, if asked for their opinion, you should recuse yourself from the Ukraine situation, given your son's role on this board that, and the investigation happening there. Uh, and I think that that really is the question here is, is was it appropriate to say this Biden deal should have been looked at? And a key part, Jeannie, of the Demo of the uh, president's legal team push back against Democrats and impeachment managers was playing videotape from Chuck Schumer and others. And what they said during the Cl Clinton impeachment trial. Here's what the clip they played on the Senate floor of Jerry Nadler back in 99. Right now. Fox News alerted the Pentagon updating the number of U.S. troops hurt in an Iranian missile strike on an Iraqi base. Retaliation for the U.S. strike that took out a top Iranian general. The Defense Department saying 50 service members suffered traumatic brain injuries. Lucas Tomlinson is following this important story from the Pentagon. Lucas, good morning. Hey, Lucas. Good morning, Ed and Sandra. That number's not trending in the right direction right now. Two weeks ago, 11 U.S. troops were hurt. We now know that number is five times greater. The Pentagon says 50 U.S. service members have been diagnosed with traumatic brain injuries or concussions. The Pentagon uses both terms interchangeably. We don't know how severe the cases are. Of those 50 soldiers, 32 have already been returned to duty in Iraq, but 18 have been transported to a U.S. medical facility in Germany where they have MRI machines. It's been three weeks since Iranian forces fired those 11 short-range ballistic missiles at a base in Iraq, housing over 1,000 U.S. troops. One missile landed just 10 yards from a bunker, according to a senior Air Force general in Baghdad. As you can see from these craters, the impacts were enormous, and many think it's fortunate no U.S. troops were killed. Early warning centers meant American troops had enough time to hunker down in bunkers for protection. During a refueling stop in Ireland on his way home last weekend, Vice President Pence met soldiers deploying to the Middle East from Fort Bliss in El Paso. Roughly 20,000 more American troops have been sent to the region since May, bringing the total to 80,000. You're going to be deployed to a region of the world that's uh, seen some action uh, in the last several weeks. Uh, but uh, I can tell you, uh, all of our information is Iran continues to stand down uh, because uh, uh, we demonstrated American strength. Pentagon officials say 10 years ago, most of these soldiers would not have been evacuated from Iraq and sent to Germany, but it's being done out of an abundance of caution. U.S. officials say they hope to restart training with Iraqi forces very soon, Ed and Sandra. All right, Lucas Tomlinson, thank you. Thank you, Lucas. We are asking the Palestinians to meet the challenges of peaceful coexistence. I hope that the Palestinians embrace this and build with Israel a future of prosperity and peace. I also hope that our other Arab neighbors embrace your vision and forge a path of reconciliation with Israel that can create for all of us a brilliant future. 
President Trump unveiling his Middle East peace plan about this time yesterday, calling for a two-state solution, proposing a tunnel to connect the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Joining us now is Fox News National Security and Foreign Affairs Analyst Waleed Ferris. Waleed, good morning to you and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. What has been the response so far to the president unveiling this plan yesterday? Sandra, I have witnessed, researched, thought about, published these peace processes for the last 35 years. We've seen many maps. We've seen many attempts in the past. Now, the map presented by the president is very sophisticated, meticulous, realistic. It goes from reality on the ground. It's not the ideological view of any side. And it takes into consideration, basically, if you look at the map, Two things, the Israeli security concern, which is the border with Jordan, that's what it is, and the Palestinian uh, concern that they are going to be connected between the West Bank and Gaza, hence the tunnel. Now, everything else is up in the air and can be renegotiated, negotiated again. And obviously, to answer your question, we've seen it in the media, all the Palestinian leaders, and not all the Arabs, most of them at least, have rejected the plan as it is. But some of the Arabs, some countries in the Gulf and others said, well, this is a beginning and we can build on it. Uh, so how can they build it, though, will lead on the point that the president is giving the Israeli prime minister the green light to annex about 30 percent of the West Bank, which you just mentioned. Palestinians upset about that point in particular. How do you bridge that divide? It... Look, if, if we look at what the Palestinians want, they don't want this map. They want a larger map. If you look at what the Israelis want, most of them, though their government said, okay, I'll engage in the next four years, there will be a transition, they don't trust what's happening within the Palestinian area, specifically Gaza. Now, to answer your question, I don't think the Israelis will begin the annexation before they have an agreement. I mean, what the president has said, okay, for the Israelis, you can start getting those territories under your sovereignty, but then there need to be a Palestinian state. Mm. So there needs still to be a mutual acceptance from both sides. I'll read to you directly from Abbas' statement says, saying that there is no deal. After the nonsense that we heard today, we say a thousand no's to the deal of the century. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, the response that we saw there, Nancy Pelosi. I hope that there will be respect to the Palestinians as they, as they participate in the negotiations. And on first read of these two pages, there appears to be a basis for negotiations. So, Waleed, the big question, where does all of this go next? It all depends on the leadership of the Palestinians and who supports them in the region. And we know that the Palestinian leadership is divided in two. Abbas, who is reacting and saying no to this map, but he wants another map. Hamas doesn't want any map. They don't want basically a two-state solution. They don't want Israel to begin with. So in my view, personal view, I think the timing for a real agreement between the two sides is after Hamas, not with Hamas. It's not going to happen as long as Hamas controls Gaza. Uh, so many presidents in both parties, as you know, American presidents have tried and failed to bring out Mideast peace. Uh, there have been a lot of reports this morning, a lot of commentary that maybe this president's unconventional approach could lead to a breakthrough. I believe that the, the, the journey of President Trump 2017 to Riyadh was the beginning of the peace process because he was able to connect with large number of Arab and Muslim leaders and serve the interests of the United States first against terrorism, but also of these Arab countries to contain Iran. It seems to me that the price is going to be Iran. And it seems to me that the president is telling the Arabs, you want the U.S. support to contain Iran and protect you. You're going to help me a little bit or more with the peace process between Israelis and Palestinians. All right. Waleed Ferris, appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. All right. New calls for travel restrictions from China. There's a very simple way to stop this virus from coming to America more than it already has, and that is to stop commercial air travel from Ch the Chinese mainland to the United States. That's exactly what I've urged the Trump administration to do today. Many airlines already doing just that. How health officials are working to reduce the risk of transmission right here in America. Plus a massive earthquake shaking millions. Where it hit, we'll have the info straight ahead. Around 2 o'clock, 
I felt the building shaking a little bit. Um, along the window, the cords were banging up against the wall, and then we got an email to uh, evacuate the building. Public health officials on high alert now for new cases of the deadly coronavirus as China struggles to contain the outbreak. Here at home, five people testing positives in four, positive in four different states. In any moment now, a plane carrying about 200 Americans from China is set to arrive in Southern California. Dr. Muntu Davis is the Los Angeles County Health Officer and joins us now. Doctor, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. First off, what can you tell us is the risk posed to Americans here at home with this virus? Well, I think we have to pay attention to the cases that we have here in the U.S. Uh, currently, we only have five cases, uh, and among those cases and their contacts, we have not seen person-to-person -person transmission. So although the situation is different in China in terms of having about 6,000 cases, uh, we don't have that same situation here. And so what is your message to Americans waking up this morning, hearing all these different news reports about protecting themselves, their families? You know, the message really is go about your normal activities and, you know, no one should be excluded based on race, country of origin or recent travel if they don't have symptoms of fever or cough, uh, coughing and shortness of breath. Um, but for those who have traveled uh, to places, uh, say, in China or other places with confirmed cases, if they come back and within 14 days start to exhibit those symptoms, then they should call their health care provider to, to get care. Well, clearly, don't go about your daily business if it involves flying to China because the warning is to not engage in any non-necessary travel to China. In fact, uh, demand is dropping so much now that some of the American carriers, including American Airlines, just announced moments ago, doctor, that they're suspending Shanghai Beijing flights from Los Angeles they are reporting significant drop in demand for travel to and from China so clearly we're seeing some people choose to change their plans yeah and that is the recommendation from the Center for Disease Control if you don't have any essential travel uh, to that region or that area then don't do it you know the risk is higher there when you were talking about the symptoms a, a moment ago, we've talked about this uh, fever, sore throat. It's very similar to the strain of the, of the flu uh, that a lot of Americans, uh, millions, have been dealing with. How do you separate that out so that people understand what they're really dealing with? You know, this is a virus like other viruses like influenza and many others that cause, you know, common cold. So really the the important thing to look at is risk in terms of who might have been exposed and travel to an area where there are a large number of cases. That's the thing that separates, uh, you know, those with flu-like symptoms who are just have the flu um, and those who might have novel coronavirus. Those who have novel coronavirus were more than likely in, in Wuhan, China or the regions in the area um, or were in contact with a confirmed case. Doctor, we're hearing about a vaccine in the works. What are you hearing on that? Um, we've heard the same from the Health and Human Services uh, press conference yesterday, uh, that they are working on a vaccine as well as looking at specific treatments uh, of these cases. All right. This is a story, obviously, we've been paying very close attention, the economic impact, the health impact for sure. Uh, Dr. Montu Davis, uh, the Los Angeles County Health Officer, we appreciate your insights, important information this morning. Dr. Davis, Thanks thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right, some panic in the Caribbean all the way up to South Florida after a powerful magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake strikes off the coast of Jamaica and Cuba. There were no reports of casualties or heavy damage, but hundreds of miles north in Miami, people say they actually felt shaking and several high-rise buildings were evacuated. Our correspondent Phil Keating is live in Miami where obviously everybody is waiting for the Super Bowl. Phil? Absolutely. It's Super Bowl fever down here. And of course, Miami, very used to uh, hurricanes, but certainly not earthquakes. But that was the very rare experience here Tuesday afternoon, uh, affecting downtown Miami as well as south in Kendall. Two tall office buildings were evacuated just as precautionary safety measures. Nobody in South Florida was injured by this earthquake or the aftershocks, nor any buildings damaged. A tsunami warning for Florida's coastline also never issued. The U.S. Geological Survey rated the intensity for South Florida as weak or moderate, a level two and three. People who described feeling their office building sway were all on upper floors of tall buildings, at least 20 floors up. Lower than that, you probably did not even notice anything. 
One of the buildings evacuated was the Stephen P. Clark government building, where a lot of county employees went out to the streets, ending their days early. They are all back to work today, by the way. The major 7.7 .7 magnitude quakes epicenter was in the Caribbean, south of Cuba, northwest of Jamaica, and northeast of the Cayman Islands, with the quake and aftershocks happening just after 2 o'clock Eastern time. People in the islands described very strong safe shaking or moderate shaking. And in the Cayman Islands, some roads are now cracked and sewage ruptured into the streets Tuesday from manholes whose covers blew off by the force of the quake. A U.S. geologist said the tsunami risk was low since the tectonic plates shifted alongside of each other not one plate shoving underneath another plate. Reports out of Cuba, especially on the East Coast, were that there was some strong shaking in Santiago de Cuba, that is the island's second largest city. And you may recall a series of major and strong earthquakes that impacted Puerto Rico a month ago. Uh, that caused many buildings to collapse, and it's reported right now and estimated that 4,000 people on that island, a uh, U.S. Commonwealth, are still homeless. Phil oh, Keating was not Sandy. shook. He's still all in place. Thank you for that report. I didn't Sam. feel it. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. American Airlines, as we mentioned a moment ago, suspending flights now to parts of China from Los Angeles, citing fears of the coronavirus impacting travel demand. And we are awaiting President Trump. A big moment at the White House coming up top of the hour. What the USMCA deal could mean for the economy and your wallet. We have just received a statement, um, a new statement from Lindsey Graham's office, the senator writing this. It is my opinion, based on the laws and facts, that additional testimony is unnecessary in this case for the sake of argument. One could assume everything attributable, attributable to John Bolton is accurate and still the House case would fall well below standards. However, I am concerned when John Bolton's credibility is attacked. It makes it more likely some will feel the need to call him as a witness. In that event, it would be important for the president and his team to call witnesses on other issues. Interesting. So, of course, the statement just coming from Lindsey Graham's office. You now. read between the lines. It seems like uh, Lindsey Graham is sending a message to various people. First, maybe to the president, who has been tweeting this morning, attacking John Bolton, as mm -hmm. we've seen other Republicans do. In recent days, the president made some comment about Bolton being fired, also saying if he hadn't stopped John Bolton, we'd be on World War VI or something like that, that he's, he's a hawk, uh, obviously. Uh, and maybe Lindsey Graham is trying to calm the White House down. Let's, let's not spark a bigger fight here, number one. But the second message that the end, Sandra, uh, about, hey, Democrats, if you yep. want to go down this road, the president and his team will get witnesses too. hint, hint, Hunter Biden and others. Right. And of course, that's been discussed for some time. Whether that there's an appetite on both sides for that, we will see. We're watching it closely. The Justice Department, meanwhile, cracking down on robocalls, suing five companies and three individuals they say were behind hundreds of millions of fraudulent calls that scammed elderly Americans. Brett Larson is here with Fox News Headlines 24-7, channel 115 on your hey. Sirius XM device. Yes, five companies, three individuals busted in this, and they were, as you mentioned, behind millions of fraudulent calls. Uh, once again, we are seeing that voice over IP, VOIP technology is the culprit behind this. The company that was busted had call centers in India. And this is the problem we have now with these robocalls. And, and one of the articles, I thought it was, it really kind of boiled it down well. Voice over IP technology is something you could walk into a Best Buy and pick up. An auto dialer, probably something you can find on eBay. A broadband internet, connect internet connection, you got yourself the recipe to make literally hundreds of robocalls every few minutes. They are a problem. The uh, FTC has constantly said this is the most complained about thing ever. So it's good to see. It's, it's good news that they busted these people that obviously will result in less robocalls. One of the companies involved in this bust, tollfreedeals.com, made 720 million calls in wow. 23 days. Um, so that is a you know, you lot of You want to get a dinner calls. table conversation going, cocktail party, you mentioned this. Yeah, and, and everyone has everybody. a visceral reaction. And, you know, listen, the FTC has, has steps that they don't answer the phone if you don't recognize the number. Let it go to voicemail, obviously, if it was important. The cell phone companies have stepped up their efforts thanks to some changes from the FCC that they can now let you block these calls. It won't even ring your phone. It won't even bother you. But still, as we're seeing here, still a problem. Fingers crossed Concerned the Justice Department. with the Department. blocking of the calls. People get worried they're going to block important calls from coming right. through, et cetera. Brett Larson, Hang on, I'm getting a call from China. Hang oh, on. hello. Hello. <laughs> Brett, yeah, thank you. Probably a robocall. <laughs>
Fox News alert from the White House. President Trump is set to sign that historic trade deal, marking a major legislative achievement. That should be happening just moments from now. We are going to have that for you live as soon as it begins. The president coming up.